Is it working now? No, just a sec. Okay, there, that seems to be working a little better. I'm not sure why projector number two is not running. Um, it claims it's supposed to be running, but it's uh, not, so um, just have to live with that. Although from standing back here, it looks like it's glowing, so I'm not sure what's happening with it. So just a couple of announcements. So assignment two was released um, due November 4th. So in this past week's tutorials, the first part of what you sort of need to do to do the work on that is uh, how do you establish a socket to send uh, UDP packets and how do you receive UDP packets. You should have gone over that in tutorial today. Sorry. So I'm hoping uh, the repos, I'll put them up on Monday. Okay. So at this particular point, it's really important that you um, understand, so I know that many of you are anxious to get going, and I hope, um, but it's really important to understand the protocol and what's going on at least at a, a fairly decent level before starting to code because what will happen is that if you don't have a good sense of what's going on, um, you will start writing code. And then you will run the program and it will work for a little bit and then it will stop working. You'll, well, by stop working, I mean it will crash, okay? And you'll look at it and you'll look at it and you'll say, oh, I never thought about that scenario. Okay? So, and so now instead of, uh, you know, having an elegant design, well, what do you do? Uh, you kind of patch it, right? And say, oh, if I make it do it this way and stuff like that, uh, th that'll cover that case. Then you run it again. And? You get a repeat performance of where it runs for that scenario you just pass it for, uh, pa passed it for, and you discover another scenario that it doesn't work for. And you look at it again and say, oh, no problem, I know how to patch that one. And pretty soon what you have is this body of code that um, does in fact kind of solve the problem, uh, but looks pretty fragile. And if anything sort of out of the ordinary comes, it's not going to be very easy for you to adjust it and fix it and stuff like that. So the first step in this is to get a good sense by looking at those traces, seeing what those packets look like and things like that, getting a good sense of, okay, so what are the possible scenarios that I could see coming back from a request that I make? So when I make a request to a, a DNS server, what are the types of responses that I could get? So there's about, I think there's about six different cases, okay? So uh, one case is really obvious. It's just sort of what, you nor what the basic thing uh, suggests to you. But those traces that I have essentially cover off a whole bunch of different cases. So if you look at the first scenario or the first case um, and look at it, that'll give you, okay, so that's sort of the basic one. And you can say, okay, well, how do I, maybe how do I solve that? Then if you look at the, another scenario, it'll say, okay, well, that's, a say, that's got a little bit of the first one, but it's a different return value. I have to do something a little bit different. So just carefully think about that. So basically what you want to do is you want to make a request to a DNS server, and we'll talk about DNS in more details. You're going to get back an answer, and then based on that answer, you've got to take some more action. And there are about six different types of answers that you can get back, or combinations of answers that you can get back that you need to deal with. And how you detect which, the, which they are is uh, 
not completely obvious because there is not a field in the protocol header that goes, I am this type of an answer. You have to sort of look at the information that's contained in the whole response to figure out what situation you're in. So that's the first thing. Start understanding that. And once you understand that, then actually the first really big thing that you have to code up is the idea of what's called um, path name compression. Uh, it's a way that they store I, uh, the fully qualified domain names. It's not like you normally think. And so you can't actually do anything until you uh, figure out how that works. Uh, it's a little bit tricky to figure out, but it's very, it's relatively easy to code. It's only like about, uh, it, it's, there's two routines that you need, and each one is about 10 lines long, and one, the, the, the one, once you've got the one, the other one is the same thing except it's got one variable name changed in it. You look at something slightly different. So the code is, I, the code's identical, it's just that you work on a different uh, area. Okay, so um, today what we're going to do is we're, we're, we're switching topics a little bit. We're looking at performance. We'll also be looking at naming. And in particular, I want to talk a little bit about UDP and also about, uh, we'll start on DNS. Okay, so what I, we want to understand a little bit about is, okay, what is UDP? When would you use it? Or when might you use it? So, you know, what are the properties of UDP that make it good for one type of application, perhaps not another type of application, and so on. And then we'll switch to DNS. And the reason we're talking about this is because it turns out that uh, DNS uses primarily UDP as a mechanism to exchange information. So this is just a, a quick intro to uh, UDP. <coughs> so UDP is another transport level protocol. Um, we've, everything that we've talked about so far has basically been on the idea of TCP where we have streams of data going from one machine to another. UDP is not a stream of data, it's more like a postcard where you address a postcard, you put it in the mailbox, and then that's the last you ever hear of it. Okay? You don't expect anything back or anything like that, and it just goes, and you don't know whether it shows up on the other end. Uh, the other end does not attempt to figure out whether or not it got there. In fact, it doesn't even know if anything was sent. Okay? So it's unreliable that way, and it's sort of often referred to as just send and forget. I'm going to send the packet, and I'm going to forget about it. Now, sometimes at the application level, they're not overly interested in forgetting about things, but there are lots of UDP type protocols where you just send the data and you really don't care anything about whether or not the other side got it. An example of something like that might be um, if you want to announce on a local area network, what you might do is you might announce what the time is. If you were a time server, you might uh, broadcast out the time using a UDP packet. And so uh, a, there's a notion of a broadcast address. We talked a little bit about that at the link layer, but there's also one at the transport layer for UDP, or at the IP network layer, I should say, and primarily used with UDP. And you send the packet out, and everyone will accept it. So in that packet, you might announce what the current time is. And so people could synchronize their clocks that way. And you wouldn't care whether or not a machine got that. Uh, you're just going to send it out. Say you send it out once a minute or something like that. and. That's sort of it. And the machines that are on the network, if they miss one, they don't overly care either because they know that within a minute they'll get another one or another attempt will be made. So you just broadcast things out like that. So, so stuff that's sort of, um, or, or you know, one standard use for this is sort of status type information. A machine just sort of says, I want to tell the rest of the network something. And so they broadcast a little message and they usually put that in UDP form. Okay. okay. So actually, um, that was, I should have switched to this slide so you could uh, have uh, focused in on that. So what I just basically said or described was this notion that the type of protocols that this is most useful for are those where the application levels uh, don't need the data to be streamed. By streamed, I mean you don't have a bunch of data you want to send and you don't want it in order or you don't care about the order. Right? And you don't care about whether it's reliably delivered or not. Okay? So if it has those properties, and UDP is uh, a good candidate for that. Um, it's also a good candidate for applications where, that are sensitive to delay. So if, there's, uh, if you want something to get through really fast, then UDP is better than TCP because there's less protocol overhead associated with it. However, it does have the downside that it's not guaranteed to get there. 
So you've sort of got this tension. It will get there quickly if it gets there. Um, if it doesn't get there, then, well, it didn't get there at all. And so you have to sort of be able to tolerate those sorts of things, that type of loss. Um, if you're sort of interested in uh, some of the types of protocols that are using UDP, if you, you on, on Unix, is there a pointer showing up there? No, okay. So on Unix, if you do something like net stat minus A and then grep for UDP, it'll list all of the currently active UDP uh, ports on your machine. Okay. So uh, it, it really depends upon what your machine is running, what will be on there, whether actually you'll even see anything or not. Uh, but usually DNS is usually one of the ones that will be showing up on there. Okay. Uh, Windows has netstat minus A. And the bottom line there is an example of something that you might see. So the UDP 00, zero means that there are zero packets going out, there are zero packets coming in, which basically means nothing is queued up to go anywhere, everything is clear. Um, and then the star means that you're willing to accept a UDP packet from anywhere if it's on port 45051. So that's, that's something else that's kind of interesting about UDP in that way is that you, uh, unlike TCP, what you do is you say, a client will say, I want to connect to a server, and they identify who they want to connect to, and there's sort of a, a real heavy duty protocol that goes on to establish that relationship. Whereas in UDP, um, as you will, I'm not sure if you saw this in the tutorials or not, but what you will need to do for your assignment, basically what you say is, um, I just want to accept data from anyone on a particular port. So you don't, you don't have to establish a relationship in advance to, by doing a notion of a connection or a setup of a connection to do that. So just to sort of put it in context, uh, TCP is sort of like sending, or sending, is like making a phone call. Um, what happens is, uh, and, you, and you have, a, the, this is analogous within your programs, you sort of have to specify who you want to call so that in assignment number one you had to indicate uh, what the IP address is and what the port number was, and then you made, an, uh, then you made a call to connect. And that sent a packet out to the other side, or to where you'd identified, and if that machine was willing to accept a connection, it would send a packet back. And at that particular point, that was when you got the uh, stream identifier or whatever it is you get in Java back uh, that you can work on. If, you, if it didn't, you got an, got an exception saying the, the connection wasn't there and stuff like that. It's very much like making a phone call in the sense that what you do is you, you take your phone, you dial your phone, and that's, it starts to ring someplace. And if the endpoint where it's ringing at, if they pick it up and answer it, you complete the call and then you carry on a conversation. And if they don't, uh, you eventually give up, which is the same sort of thing with this notion of connect. Whereas with UDP, um, there's no notion of that. There is no notion of saying, oh, before I send you the actual data, I have to establish a relationship with you with the connect command. You just sort of say, nope, I construct my packet, send it, they're not listening, so be it, but it doesn't stop the data from going out. Okay. So here's some of the, there's a fair bit of this in the, uh, on this in the textbook. So this is just sort of a summary of some of the, you know, the primary differences. So with TCP, there is a notion of having to establish a connection through a, uh, set, establish the connection through a setup, which is what happens when you do connect. And it's only after you've made, completed that setup that you're allowed to send data. Whereas with uh, UDP, there, you don't have to do any of that. You can just sort of construct the packet, say where you want it to go, and then have it sent. Um, TCP is reliable that once you have it established, it guarantees that the, or as best it can, that the data will get there. Okay. Um, with UDP, there is no notion of reliability. Uh, in TCP, uh, this is actually a, a fairly major one. Uh, this notion of streaming where the data goes one after the other. Okay. So you send the data and you don't know where the boundaries between the various writes are on the on the client side, right? So if you have, <coughs> if you have your client and it's going right to your connection and you write some data and you do that over and over and over again, you have no notion of where, you know, did this guy write 10 bytes, 20 bytes, and 30 bytes? On the receiving side, 
you don't get it as 10 bytes, 20 bytes, and 30 bytes. You get it in whatever the network decides it wants to give it to you in. It might give it to you one byte at a time. It might give it to you all at once. It might give it to you in 15 byte chunks or something like that. But you have no notion of where the boundaries with respect to the writes were. So that makes it quite challenging uh, when you want to send data that has boundaries in it, a notion with it. So in assignment number one, for example, you're, it, you essentially use the line feed as a delimiter between the commands. Right? So you'd send the command, there would a line feed, that would tell the receiver that it's done. Okay? So it knows what's, because the receiver is sort of seeing the data come at it, it's going to say, well, how do I know when I've got a command? Right? Well, once I've got a carriage return on the end of the, across the stream, then I've got a command and I'll process it. So that's an application level thing. And so that's how it sort of gets what the boundaries are. And in addition, um, in assignment number one, there was no notion of sending multiple commands one right after the other, so there would be also be a pause there. Um, with UDP, on the other hand, when you send something, if you send 1,000 bytes, the receiver will get a th the, all those 1,000 bytes if it shows up. Okay? So it's not like it gets 500 once, or you know, gets 500 of the bytes, does another read and gets the remaining 500. Gets them all at once. This also means there's a maximum size that you can send. Um, which I can never remember, but I think it's 64,000 or something like that. Sir, so CDP has a maximum packet size. Um, when you were talking about that, that the releasing, you don't know the boundary, so the receiving machine doesn't know when to stop listening. Um, it's more, okay, so the, the receiving machine doesn't know the boundaries. So if the, if the data, if the, if, there's, if the data is organized into things that have logical boundaries, then you have to have some way of demarking them. Right? It won't be like saying, oh, well, if you just do a read operation, whatever you get, that's the unit to work on. You might have to say, oh, I got 10 bytes. Then you have to analyze those 10 bytes to see whether or not you got the boundary that's important. And then if not, you have to go and pull some off. It could also mean that you went further than the boundary, in which case you only process the first part and have to remember that you've got this other part to go with subsequent reads. Whereas with, uh, whereas with UDP, it will all come as one unit. That's TCP. This is TCP, yep. Does TCP announce how much it's sending? Well, as part, so as a part of all of the protocol packets, they have in them an indication of size. Yep. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Yep. Um, are you talking about the streamed one? The, the, the right boundaries are preserved? Okay, I'll get to that in just a sec. Okay. Yep. Is it possible that you might lose part of a UDP packet and a destination might only receive a piece of it? No. It'll get the whole thing or none of it. Okay. Yep. So, so it's very it's nice that way. It's very atomic um, in, in those sense. Either you get the thing or you don't. Now, what can happen, though, um, is that if you send 1,000 bytes, and the receiver only wants to receive 1,000, uh, 100, uh, 100 bytes, what will happen is it will take the first 100 of the 1,000, give you the first 100, and throw away the other 900. Okay. So you always want to be quite careful in that when you're on the receiving side of things, that you make sure that you have uh, enough data space there to receive the largest packet that the other side is supposed to be able to send to you, because you don't want it truncated. And that's a separate issue from the maximum size of an actual packet. Right? So the maximum, let's say the maximum size is 64K. So if you try to send you know, more than 64K, I can't remember whether you get an error or whether it just sends 64K. Because uh, UDP, you would never want to send 64K packets. So that's a different story. Um, but so you'd send it. And then the other side, whatever it wants to read, it will get up to that many bytes of it. Okay. Now the idea of right order and preserving that. So uh, when you have, make a phone call and you talk to somebody, uh, the syllables and the sounds that make up the words arrive in the order that they're set. And, uh, and so they, they don't, if I say, hello, James, it doesn't go James, hello, or however, that would be backwards or something like that, right? They, it comes in the right order. 
And that's the same as with respect to TCP. In whatever order the bytes get written, that's the order that they show up on the other side. Okay, so there's no notion of them being mixed up or anything like that. UDP, on the other hand, um, because it sends these blocks or chunks, or partly because of that, it'll, if it sends two, two UDP packets in a row, you do not know which one will arrive first. Either one could arrive first. Okay. Uh, it won't mix up the data within one, but packet two could arrive before packet one, packet one could arrive before packet two. So you have to be prepared for this notion that uh, things might not be in the order that you expect. Okay. So that's what's meant by the right order is preserved. So in the case of TCP, the order in which they're sent out is preserved, and in the case of UDP, any order can happen. And then just the last point is that if these boundaries and things like that are important, then you should be using TCP. Um, if uh, they're not that important, um, or not that important, if you don't care about them at all, then you can go and use uh, TCP, uh, UDP, I should say. I think I said that backwards. Yeah. <laughs> Nods from people in the head saying, yes, he's, he's talking crazy stuff there. So, um, if, yeah, so if the right boundaries are important and order is important, then TCP is the way to go. And if those things don't matter to you, then UDP is something to consider. UDP is lighter weight, so it's, all, it's really good for protocols that sort of are what are referred to as request response type protocols, where you send a request that is small and you get back an answer that is small as well. So you send something and all you do is expect back a small answer back. But then if you use UDP, doesn't the receiver have to delay to make sure it reassembles all the packets in order? Only if order matters. That's, that's why I said that in UDP, if it's important that, or sorry, it's more applicable to those situations when you don't care about the order. So you avoid exactly that problem that you don't have to stop and reorder things and get them. So Linux like Skype uses UDP, I remember, I believe. Um, if they don't, they could, yes. But so, then so what they do, or what you would do in a situation like Skype, is you would put um, at the application level, uh, so remember what, what's going to happen is we'll have our protocol packet and so we'll have some uh, data here and we'll have our UDP header here, we'll have IP here and, uh, and so at this level, this is the data that makes up the, the voice of your, the part of your conversation, right? And so, that's, so this makes it part of the application. So what they'll do at the application level is they'll sort of say, they'll put in here probably a sequence number of some sort. And so now what happens is they just, every time they get a voice sample to send, they increment the sequence number and out it goes. So on the receiver side, what you're seeing is you're seeing these voice samples come in and you can tell what, whether they're out of order or not based on this sequence number. But Voice conversations and understanding voice is really sensitive to delay. Um, so that's why you want, you want to get there fast. If one arrives out of, so if, suppose that we had sequence number 1000, and then the next packet we saw was sequence number 1002. Okay, so we didn't see 1001. Knowing the property that UDP could arrive, uh, could be out of order, we might think, well, what I should do then is wait for, try, wait some amount of time before th to see if 1001 shows up, and actually, if it does, then I'll play it. If not, I won't play it. Okay. Or, well, I'll have to sort of give up and start. And so, if you start waiting, you're going to have a delay, right? So. Right? If you're waiting for packet 1000, or sorry, if it's, it goes to 1000, 1001 doesn't show up, 1002 doesn't, shows up. If you wait for 1001 before starting, continuing with your play, you're going to have a little pause there while you wait for it. But it might never come. It could have been lost. So it turns out that with voice, what you want to do is you probably just want to play it as soon as it arrives. And what you use the sequence numbers for is to avoid the problem of saying, oh, I got 1,000, 1,002 shows up, I'll play 1,002, then 1,001 shows up, you say, no, I don't want to play that because that would sort of be the equivalent of saying, hello, James, and you're getting, you got oh, quiet, James, hello, right? Well, that would actually kind of make sense, but <laughs> other ones might not make sense, okay? So, um, but you get the idea, something like that. And 
So these samples, I'm not sure what Skype does, but on the telephone system, they send, uh, um, uh, they do 8,000 samples a second in the telephone system, uh, is how many they're doing. And so they, they break them up and they send them, I think, up in 256 bytes at a time. Um, and they break them up into samples and that's how long they hold them for before they send. And what they'll do is that's almost small enough that if you miss one, you don't actually notice it. The ear quite can't, so the, the, they play little games like that. They'll say if you miss one sample, you probably don't notice it. If you miss a couple, you'll hear a little pop or a click. Um, and if they're really, really uh, into it, what they'll do is they'll take the two on the ends, they'll take the one that, the, they'll take the one that arrived, that they've already played, the one that has arrived uh, that they know is, has one missing in between, and then they'll interpolate those and make a fake one to go in between based on the changes in the frequencies between the two and stuff like that. Okay, so they'll, do, they'll play tricks like that. But that obviously takes more computational power and things like that to do that. But that's how they do those sorts of things. And that's why they get away with UDP. Or you, or you can use UDP for things like that. Okay. Um, and, and so you, Skype is a good, or Skype or any sort of voice thing like that is good because it's something where you really want, it's got that property that you want that stuff to arrive there quickly. And, and it's very time sensitive. Right? And so those are two of the properties, so that's why you might choose something like UDP for that. Any other questions on that? Okay, so <coughs> just a little bit of an aside, uh, more of an aside is, okay, so how does the receiver know if the packet is UDP or TCP? Okay, so just sort of to make sure we have a complete picture of what's going on in our protocol stack. Okay, so what happens is that at the link layer, when the packet goes out, it gets a link layer header, and in addition to the link source and link destination fields in there that get filled in, there's one other field, and that's the network level protocol. And that says, it's announcing saying, this packet that I'm carrying, okay, that, that's following me, the rest of the data that I follow with me is for the following type of protocol. Okay? So you might be, so for us, uh, we almost always see IPv4. Finding anything on our networks that's other than IPv4 is uh, pretty challenging. I went through a bunch of traces to trying to find some non-IPv4 traffic, um, and I didn't have any luck. Okay, so, uh, but you might see uh, IPv6 traffic. Uh, you might see IPX, which is, was uh, an old Microsoft, uh, no, not a Microsoft, um, well, I can't even think of their name now. Pardon? No, not Sun. No, it was, it was, a, it was for Microsoft file sharing. Um, and uh, it, it was back in the 90s. So, uh, so you, you see that. And so, so what happens then is that we have our packet coming like this. And we have, the if we look at the link layer, essentially as it's processed, once it's accepted, and you're in your machine, what you'll do is you'll say, okay, if it's IP, send it up to an IP stack. If it's IPX, send it up like that. Okay, so these, this is, represents protocol processing stacks. So I'm going to just focus on the IP part of things. Okay, so this would be the network layer here. And then what the network layer does, in addition to the IP source and destination addresses in there, assuming that it belongs to this one, there's another field in there that says, well, what's the transport protocol? So for us, mostly what that means is, is it UDP or, ID or um, TCP? So if we look at that, we would go here, we've got IP. So this might be TCP. And this might be UDP here. And there are other, I think there's pop and stuff like that that also run on top of IP. Okay. So there's stuff like that. And then we get to the transport layer. So once we're in the transport layer, what do you do? Well, with respect to UDP, you look at the port numbers and based on sort of convention, different port numbers have different services attached to them, or are supposed to have different services attached to them. And the same is true on TCP, except TCP has additional information. 
So in addition to the source and destination ports which form part of the transport layer, in TCP there's other information like what's the sequence number. Okay, so there's a sequence number in there, um, there are acknowledgement bits and things like that and that's how the receiver, and we'll see more about this later, can figure out whether or not packets have arrived in order and if it turns out that packets are out of order and missing, what it will then do is it will talk back to the sender and say, I'm missing packet 23, please resend it. And only when it gets all of them in order does it sort of start moving the data on up. So that's how it preserves the order in that for you and brings it up as a stream. So for TCP, the sequence number of the packets is actually the protocol. Where is that? It's on the application. That's correct. In TCP, um, this would, we would have a, let's say, a sequence number here. Whereas in UDP, if this is important, if sequence order is important, that then becomes the responsi responsification. The responsibility of the application pro level. And so it would be there. That's exactly right. Okay. So, any, so that sort of does that. And if you fire up Wireshark, for example, um, Right, so here, this is a sec here. Um, so if we fire up Wireshark and look at a trace, you can see here we've got the, um, let me collapse some of these. We've got our Ethernet header here and it's got the source, the destination, and you'll notice there that it says what type it is. Okay, so in this particular case, uh, 8,000 hex is the type that means IP. And if you pick any, if I pick any of them there, they'll all have 8,000 in there. Then if we look, so let me uh, close this header. If I look at the IP header, okay, here you'll notice that the protocol down here is 6. So it sa says it's TCP. If I go and look for something like um, DNS, you'll notice there the protocol there is 17, which meaning it's UDP. Okay. Okay. So you can take some of those traces that I've given you and stuff like that in, in for assignment number two or just other ones that are around and you can sort of play with this and you can sort of see uh, how that works. Actually the ones for assignment number two won't be interesting because um, they're all TC, or they're all UDP. <laughs> so they're all the same that way. Okay. Oops. sure why it backed up on me. <coughs> okay. So let, oh, yes? So are all these protocol stacks managed by the operating system? Sorry, are all the protocol stacks like managed, by the managed by the operating system? Um, sort of. Okay, so anything that you're likely to encounter, the answer is yes. But do they have to be? The answer is no. Okay, so given, you know, Unix, Windows, everything like that, they would all be up until the application layer would all be done in the operating system. But I worked on a project where um, only the link layer was in the operating system and then I, I had to write the network layer in above. Um, so uh, it, 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 that was a long time ago. Uh, nowadays, it would, they would just have the real, it would all probably be in the operating system. Yeah. Because you want to integrate this with the uh, input and output, like the file I.O. and stuff like that, reading and writing, you want to integrate it with that. And to, if, uh, once you want that to be the case, it has to be in the operating system because the applications can't sort of uh, fire it off to somebody else that way. Okay. Okay. 
Any other questions? OK, so let's talk about DNS. Okay. So this is a service that maps um, names to IP addresses, among other things. But that's the one stuff that we're mostly going to be interested in. Um, and so we're going to look at it for a couple reasons. One is that it's an interesting sort of um, exercise or case study in how to build big distributed systems. Okay. So that's one. The other is it also shows us how you can use something like UDP. Okay. And so it gives us a little bit of introduction to those two other aspects of networking. So just a few things about this first. Okay. So I think we've touched on this before, but just keep in mind that an IP address is associated with an interface, not with a machine. Okay, so when we say that, um, you know, talk to machine A, well, machine A may have multiple IP addresses. So in particular, you're probably familiar with that with your own laptops. Uh, you have one IP address when you're wireless, another one when you're wired, and if you have both wireless and wired at the same time, you have two different IP addresses. And the same could be true of your phone or anything like that. <coughs> so here's some of the issues then. Uh, addresses can change. By that I mean the addresses associated with a particular machine, because we like to think about machines. Right? As people, we don't like to think about addresses. What we like to think about, this is my laptop. This is the machine in my office. This is some particular web server. You're more interested in the notion of a machine. So what the part of the idea behind DNS is to say, well, what we can do is we can sort of give this notion of a name to a machine or in some sense. And then we can have it identify particular interfaces so that we can sort of treat that as a machine. And of course, we also have terrible time remembering numbers as opposed to names, right? If I said, you know, asked you, think of all of the websites that you go to. Uh, think of what it would be like if you had to remember the IP addresses of all of the websites that you went to. You can remember the names, right? But remembering the IP addresses is a little more challenging, okay? So we're not very good at that. So the idea is a domain name system, and its, it's goal then is to map names to these IP addresses, and we'll think of these names as being attached to machines. Okay. And one of the other nice things about something about like a name is that it can mask changes to IP addresses. So if you say, you know, um, Suppose that the computer science department's web server, its name is www.cs.ubc.ca. Um, do you know where that machine is? In your office. Not in my office, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good try, though. It's, it's I, I think, I'm not even sure. I think it's in a machine on the second floor of the, of the west wing of the ISIS building. OK. <laughs> ICCS. <laughs> That's how we say it. <laughs> so, pardon? Oh, sorry? Is that how it's pronounced? Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's, pardon? I've been unaware of that for four years. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's how we pronounce it, ISIS. <laughs> So it, w it didn't have the bad connotations <laughs> when its name first came out, right? So it used to be known as Caesar, and then they changed the name, and it became ISIS. So that was <laughs> so Caesar was the Center for Integrated Systems Research or something like that, and I can't remember what ISIS st stands for now. Integrated Center of Cognitive Systems and Research or something like that, and so. Um, but if it's there, suppose then that the de department decided that, hey, what I want, uh, we're going to farm out our website to some other company in downtown Vancouver. So we're going to have to take our machine down there, or we're going to buy resources on a machine in downtown Vancouver. Well, as we know, uh, the chances of us being able to take our IP address to downtown Vancouver uh, is probably pretty small. Right? We're going to have to use whatever IP addresses are sort of available in that subnet or in that AS wherever we're going to. Um, so we wouldn't want to say, okay, well, we have to change our name. And so what you can do, so something like this, it says, okay, well, it's still www.cs.ubc.ca, but now when you look up that name, you'll get a different address. And so now we can, we can move our equipment and stuff like that, so it hides things like that as well. So it's some nice properties like that. 
Okay. So let's think for a bit about how you might implement a system to do something like that. Okay. And let's be very naive in our approach. Okay. So if we're really naive, okay, <coughs> what might we do? We might establish a single server someplace and it will contain all of the mappings from names to IP addresses in the world. Okay. Now, I see smiles and everything like that because all of you people are thinking that's absolutely ridiculous. But if you go back to, remember when Bob Kahn was talking about uh, the start of the internet and stuff like that? He said, well, you know, there was, you know, how many machines could there be on the internet and stuff like that? You know, we could maybe have, what, four networks and a <laughs> few machines on it and stuff. Well, uh, in a world like that, a central server might not be such a bad idea. But you guys are sitting there smiling, thinking, okay, this doesn't sound like a very good idea. So why is it not a good idea? Single point of failure. So you've got a single point of failure, yep. Subject to political interference. Okay, so it's, uh, <laughs> it's an interesting way of putting that. Um, <laughs> the way that the networking folk like to say that is, um, uh, I don't want someone else telling me what my name should be, okay, so, but yes, okay, subject to political uh, interference, we can look at it that way, yeah? You'll have a geographic problem because people on the other side of the world will take a long time for their request to happen. Right, so there's a, there's a notion of how long will it take to, you know, if you happen to be right next to the name server, it's not going to take as long for that traffic to get there and get back an answer as if you're completely on the other side of the world, so that's, Okay, so there's a, that's a performance issue, right? There's a performance issue. The server will have a lot of traffic. Right, so in addition to being um, uh, performance with respect to latency or delays, there's also, we've got this one machine that's gonna have to handle tons of traffic from all over the, all over the world parts irrelevant, that's just gonna have to have tons of traffic. And you might think, okay, that's probably not good either. It's not single, but this is exactly what is happening. Pardon? Aren't there, aren't there a clone of a bunch of the same server? Okay, so that's the next one, replicated server. Okay. So, um, okay. So, no, that's not what actually is happening. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Anyone else want to suggest anything? Yeah? Well, you'd have a lot of addresses in one server. Okay, so. Um, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of sort of the, I know, I know what you're meaning, I'm trying to think of the way to sort of express that. Um, um, it's just plain big, I guess, right? It's, it's a real, you've got uh, administrative issues associated with managing the size of this thing. Right? And then going along with the size of this thing combined with the political interference is this notion of how does someone communicate updates that they want. Suppose that UBC or CS does want to move their web server. Uh, who do they contact to move it or tell them that they're moving it and make sure that the change is right and stuff like that. Okay, so, yep. Get into like security issues if the uh, DNS is compromised, if the route can, it can resolve to a different place. So there's also the potentially, the suggestion down here is there's also the issue associated with, um, I think that sort of almost goes to the political interferences. Uh, you're maybe perhaps more vulnerable to somebody <coughs> else saying, uh, giving out some false information about a particular name or something like that. So you've actually done a very good job of uh, enumerating the issues. In fact, I don't have any more to add. You've, you've touched on all of the big ones. Okay. So, um, so we'll, we'll abandon the notion that there's going to be a single server. Okay. So the next sort of step from a single server is to say, okay, uh, let's look at the problems that were identified of um, Lots uh, of latency that, in other words, it's you're at, at, depending upon where you are, it's going to determine how quickly you can get a response. And uh, also the other one that says, okay, uh, if you have a single machine, it's going to be subject to a lot of traffic. Okay. So the, the obvious way of, or not say the obvious, but one of the, the standard strategies for that is, well, what we'll do is we'll replicate it and we'll put a bunch of them out there. So what that does is essentially if you have X amount of traffic and you have N servers, assuming that the requests are evenly distributed, then now each server only has to handle X over N amount of traffic. So that's sort of the next step. So what 
So there's still issues with that. Okay. One of the servers is in the replicated system will have to be the master server, inevitably, so, that the others draw information. Okay, so, so, your so the problem I think you've identified is that uh, now you've got all of these servers out there, and uh, when you make a change, you somehow have to propagate that change to these servers. What's the strategy that you're going to use for doing that? Are you going to still have a central server model for that where you have to make the changes at a central one and then they get propagated out? And uh, how long does it, how quickly do those changes have to be propagated? So that's uh, an issue. Yeah. I, th I saw someone else, or did they, same thing? Okay. We still have the issue of political interference and stuff like that, right? The, the notion that, hey, I don't want you uh, touching my stuff, right? I don't want you handling my names. So we've still got sort of, other than sort of addressing the issues associated with performance, late, uh, like traffic load and latency, we haven't really changed much. We still have many of the same sorts of problems. Okay. So here's the solution that they've come up with. <coughs> what they've, the, the way that DNS works is that you have a bunch of servers that are called root DNS servers. So there's a number of those spread all around the world. In fact, there are two of them located in Vancouver. Okay. And what they do is, oh, I, I better put up a name first. I have to put up a name here. And so what they do is they don't have all of the addresses of the internet in them. They only have the addresses of this last part of the name, okay, this, the, the, the suffix part, the .ca, the .org, .edu .com. So what they essentially do is they say, I don't know how to get, so if, if you ask them, the way that DNS works is you ask a question of a DNS server. And so a question you would ask would be something along the lines of, what's the IP address of a.b.c.org or .ca? And it will come back to you, if things are working properly, it will come back to you and say, I don't know, but I suggest that you try one of these other name servers. And I will tell you what they are, are right? So for example, if it's .ca, they'll say, you should try one of the .ca name servers, which are those second level domain name servers there and they should be able to help you out, okay? And so they'll return to, you know, the 10 or 15 uh, domain name servers that are for CA. So what you then do is you then, so what you're doing is you first ask the question to the root DNS server, and it says, I don't know, but here's someone who might. And then you take that and you ask the question, same question. Do you know where a.b.c.ca is? And you send it off to the CA domain name server, and if all things work, <coughs> it will tell you, for example, it, in the case of c.ca, C it would tell you who could do C, but if we looked at something like UBC, it would say, I don't know the answer to that, but there is this ubc.ca name server, if you're looking up something like www.cs.ubc.ca, that might know. So you go and you ask it. And you keep doing this until one of two things happens. Either you get an answer, or it says no such name. Okay. Right. So, for example, at ubc.ca, uh, if it's actually cs.ubc.ca, it will actually go to a CS name server. However, there are other units on campus that don't have their own name servers, and it would just resolve it right away. The, the UBC, the name server that's for UBC, actually might know, for example, all the Earth and Ocean Science addresses, maybe all the ones for arts and stuff like that. So whatever they have. The CS ones, on the other hand, know we've got our own private name server for that. Okay? And so you just sort of keep going like that. And eventually you get an answer, either a good or a bad one. Okay? So what we'll do is we'll stop there. <laughs> And then uh, next class, uh, we'll look at, OK, what type of information do you get back, and how do you use that information?
you know, piece. I know the piece. Yeah. Uh, you don't have one. Oh, oh, I should be. I'll just start with the top. If you understand how it's At the time, was it was pretty expensive. Double, du double, what double is. what high end was. High end was. Well, I got it. I got it at the time when like DDR three was coming out. 